I'm Bill Henry and I want to discuss variable flow condenser water for your chiller. While variable flow condenser water is a viable strategy to save some energy, the actual savings are relatively small compared with condenser water reset. Moreover, there are plant configurations where this strategy is problematic. So let's start with some pros and cons. Variable flow can be considered with these conditions. First, where one has multiple chillers and a condenser water is piped in a series parallel configuration. That is, the return header to the cooling tower is common for all chillers. But each chiller is supplied directly by its own pump in parallel with the other chillers. And number two would be where the condenser water piping pressure drops are high with long run configuration and significant riser heights to the cooling towers. And another consideration is that if you are using condenser water reset, then the reset algorithm should be designed with variable flow as a consideration. Now here is a list where variable flow is problematic with the following configurations and situations. Number one here is where you've got multiple chillers on a common condenser water supply header and it is necessary to balance the flow to each chiller with valves or flow limiters. And number two is where the typical configurations with cooling towers close to the chillers and generous pipe sizes that ensure low pressure drops. And then there are situations where low flows contribute to significant contamination buildup in the condenser barrels. This typically might happen when you have chillers which are designed with oversized tubes and low condenser barrel pressure drops. And number four, where we have the, where the design allows the flow of one chiller to be spread across two towers to increase tower efficiency. Here, low variable flow could result in cooling towers below the hydraulic limit. And finally, if you are using condenser water reset, and the reset algorithm is designed for constant flow, then that will also limit the potential savings from variable flow. So let's see variable flow condenser water in operation by viewing the display from a chiller plant optimizer. We have an outside wet bulb of 60 degrees Fahrenheit and the load is 100%. Temperature set point here is in manual and the condenser water flow mode is in design. That is, uh, we have a fixed condenser water flow mode right here. And we also see our flow rate. It's actually averaging around 2800 GPM. Uh, the actual design is 2808 GPM. The first change that we will make is to go to variable flow. Now our actual flow actually dropped slightly to about 2750, 2750 GPM on average. And we can actually check our actual load which will explain why this is and we're, we are actually averaging about 980 ton of load. We have now looked at two states of operation. I'll make a couple more adjustments in load and temperature and then I'll compare these different states with some simple calculations. Now this is state three and I've dropped the load to about 700 tons, 70%. So we're actually probably clocking about 712 tons. Now we're going back to uh, screen two and we can see that our flow rate has dropped. So the flow rate is now averaging uh, about 1,975 GPM, uh, a 775 uh, GPM reduction. And this, uh, of course, reflects the lower system load. So with the variable flow, the control algorithm is maintaining a 10 degree delta T between the cold and hot water temperature by controlling the flow and we see uh, the results. Now I'm making one more change. 
which I'm going to call state 4, and I'm going to adjust the condensed water temperature set point mode uh, in, into the auto mode. And then we'll see a change in the condensed water temperature. The uh, condensed water temperature has dropped now from 85 degrees down to about 76.3 degrees Fahrenheit. And actually the flow rate has dropped about 50 GPM as well. So in state one we can calculate the design heat rejection load from the design delta T and design flow. Uh, right here the heat rejection in BTUs and we can uh, convert this to 1170 tons. We can compare that with the design 1000 tons and we have a uh, design heat rejection of 117 percent of the actual load. In state two we change the control method to variable condensed water flow. The flow rate just dropped slightly and we can confirm this by checking. When we check the actual load it to be about 980 tons and just below the maximum capacity. And again we calculate the heat rejection and see that it has decreased uh, insignificantly this small change. So as we make that we can see that uh, we're at 116.9 percent of actual load for the heat rejection component. In state 3 we made a significant change and dropped the load to around 70 percent. And we see a significant change in flow rate with the condenser water temperature maintained at a 10 degree delta T. So we can calculate the heat rejection as a percentage of the total load and we see this drop. And we'll also see a change in the percent heat rejection. And this is due to a more efficient operation of the variable speed chiller that we are simulating. It has little to do though with the reduced flow. 823 tons now is the calculated heat rejection load and if we compare that to the actual uh, cooling load of 712 tons, the heat rejection is about 115.6 percent of the actual load. Finally, in state four, we changed the temperature mode to automatic and the condenser water temperature dropped to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, we see a small change in the flow rate right here, which is a result of condensed water reset and improved chiller efficiency. Now when we calculate our heat rejection rate and we see it at 802 tons and we see that over the load, actual load, the heat rejection rate is 112.6% uh, of the actual load. Now this heat rejection rate compared to the previous changes is fairly significant. And I'll show that now with some additional calculations. But before I want to proceed to a set of calculations that uh, gives us some energy conversions that we can work with. Here uh, we have a simple energy conversion. We can look it up and we know that there's 3.415 BTU per watt. And if we take 12,000 BTUs, as there's 12,000 BTUs in a ton, uh, and divide that by 3.415, we get 3,514 watts, or 3.514 kilowatts. And again, since 12,000 BTUs per hour is equivalent to one ton of refrigeration, we can say that one ton is the equivalent of 3.514 kilowatts. Now I'm going to use that conversion rate here to convert our heat rejection load uh, and to convert that to uh, uh, some a form of energy so that we can make some uh, uh, valid uh, comparisons of efficiency. So in state one we use design values for flow and temperature to calculate the heat rejection load. The heat load in excess of the actual load represents the work input by the chiller compressor. So with negligible exceptions, this accounts for all of the energy input. 
and we can then calculate the chiller design power and calculate its design efficiency. In state one, the chiller efficiency is about is 500 is 0.597 kW per ton. So we took the heat rejection. The total heat rejection is 117% of the actual load. It's the 17% of that though over the actual load is the work of the refrigeration as I pointed out. And so we can calculate this and convert it to kilowatts and we get 597 kilowatts. And of course, if we put that over the you know, unit capacity, we get 0.597 kW per ton. And in state two, we can make the same calculation. We come out with 0.594 kW per ton. And since this is a variable speed chiller, we would expect a small improvement with the slight load reduction, but note that it is fairly small at this point and maybe we should even discount it. In state three, we made a significant reduction in load and a measurable improvement in chiller efficiency. Not a large improvement, but enough to measure. And this is uh, definitely due to operating in a more efficient zone with the variable speed chiller and of course one of the selling points for this type of a chiller. So uh, we have 0.548 kW per ton at 712 tons. In state four, the chiller efficiency has improved quite significantly. And this time the only change was in the condensed water temperature. As we put the temperature set point mode in automatic and the condensed water temperature was reset from 85 degrees to 76 degrees, I would say that 0.443 kW per ton is a significant improvement over 0.548 kW per ton, primarily due just to condensed water reset. So finally, I think I just want to make a couple of points here. I showed you how variable condensed water flow is controlled by maintaining the temperature difference across the chiller condenser barrel to a constant 10 degrees. The second point was to show in a different way the efficiency improvement using condensed water reset. And one more, perhaps peripheral point is to show off the sophistication of the simulator that is used here and that is used to customize the operation of the chiller plant optimizer for different plant configurations.